Great. So look, um, thank you, uh, Tony, and and uh, welcome everyone there on Bath and uh, online. And indeed, this is perhaps you're wondering quite uh, uh, what the connection between the Herschels, and I'm going to say the Herschels in plural, it's not just William, um, uh, to Ireland is. But in fact, there are some interesting uh, interesting connections uh, which I want to explore and, and introduce you to tonight. So perhaps I'll just start, though, by perhaps saying a little bit about how I actually even got to give this lecture. So indeed, as as they've been told, I'm the director of the observatory uh, in Armagh. And in fact, the backdrop behind me uh, is uh, is indeed uh, is is the, is the observatory. You can see the two uh, the two uh, the two main domes that we've got, and, and in front of here. And indeed, we have an ancient observatory which goes back very much to the time of the Herschels. But in fact, the reason that th this lecture came about was I was co contacted uh, last summer by a group, an orchestra from Sligo. Now, Sligo is a town on the west coast of Ireland, uh, and they were planning to do a concert series, uh, just like uh, you all know the 200th anniversary uh, of William Herschel's uh, passing. They wanted to do a concert series which actually played uh, some of uh, Herschel's music. Uh, and of course, knowing that we were the only, we're the only major planetarium uh, in, in Ireland, they actually contacted us about possibly uh, playing this music inside our planetarium. And we do have a planetarium as well as the observatory here in Armagh. Now, now, in fact, once we had that contact, we said, well, actually, we, we actually have quite a few direct connections to the Herschels ourselves. And out of that, we actually ended up doing a concert where we actually included uh, tales from the astronomical endeavors of the Herschels in, in with the music. And so it was born essentially the talk I'm going to give tonight, which I've expanded, uh, uh, expanded since there. So let me just give you, sorry, the wrong one there. Um, first of all, because since uh, you're probably not all familiar with the, with, with the island across the water, and indeed some of the astronomy that goes on there, let me just give you a very quick introduction, uh, in particular to three of the historic observatories, which will be coming up uh, as, as, as my talk goes on. So these observatories, <clears throat> indeed, they do go back to the Georgian era. The oldest, in fact, is Dunsink Observatory, which is just outside Dublin, goes back to 1785. Uh, my own observatory in Armagh was, is 1790, so just five years later. Uh, you see by the distinctive domes uh, what you see in the observatories, that was a key feature uh, of the observatories at the time. And then there's another observatory, it's really a kind of private observatory uh, in a place called Burr, which is in the sort of central part of Ireland, Burr Castle, uh, and it had uh, the world's largest telescope for a period of over 70 years, what's called the Leviathan Telescope over here. So my talk tonight will touch upon the, these three observatories uh, and how the work of those observatories actually very much uh, um, um, came from or was inspired uh, by uh, connections uh, with, with the Herschels. In fact, all the Herschels came into this. So the first thing I'll show, um, of course, I don't need to tell a, a group like this about the, 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 um, the stunning discovery by William Herschel, which made his name and indeed changed all of astronomy, the discovery uh, of Uranus in, in 1781, the first planet um, uh, essentially, essentially discovered since antiquity. But, and of course, this had connections and implications and, and consequences right across society, particularly in science and the Enlightenment and the Renaissance period going on. And one of the consequences of, of Herschel's discovery was, in fact, the foundation of our observatory here in Armagh. So I want to talk a little bit about how that is connected. And it goes back through the Archbishop. The, one of the really interesting things about um, Armagh is that we are founded through the Church of Ireland, through the uh, benevolence uh, of an archbishop. Uh, he actually was a Yorkshireman originally, uh, but the archbishop um, was the primate, what's called the primate uh, of all Ireland, uh, and his cathedral city was in Armagh. But um, Archbishop Robinson also had a residence uh, in Bath, uh, and indeed he spent quite a bit of time in Bath. And so we know uh, in, the, in the 1780s, he would have uh, been in the same society that uh, that William Herschel was in. And so, of course, the great discovery of Uranus and, and, and the sort of essentially revolution uh, in, 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 in science, I mean, this was the time of the Enlightenment, we know that he was essentially inspired by this discovery, uh, and he decided he wanted to have his own observatory. Uh, and being independently wealthy, he, he basically set about and founded the observatory. So we now have in, in Armagh an observatory be, built on a hill, which can actually be seen uh, from the Archbishop's Palace across the other side of our small city. And he also had the great foresight 
to have an act of parliament passed. Now, this was when the Irish parliament um, passed, it was before the act of uh, union, there was, a, there was a parliament actually in Dublin. And this, uh, this um, uh, act, I've actually put the, uh, the cover up here, the, the front piece, you can actually read it there. It says, for settling and preserving a public observatory and museum in the city of Armagh forever. So essentially, uh, Herschel's discovery inspired the foundation of our observatory in Amar, and we have now been running continuously ever since. It's been a, an observatory where research has continued uninterrupted, and in fact, it's now the longest running observatory in these islands where, where essentially it's being used for its original purpose. It's not a museum. Uh, it retains many of its original instruments, and science continues in it today. So it all goes back essentially to those times uh, from inspiration from Herschel. So I'm just going to spend the next two or three slides just to give you a bit of introduction to our observatory, and then I'll come back to some of the things that we've been doing and how they connect uh, to the times of the Herschel. So here we see the, the view of the observatory uh, from the south side, and you see the two principal domes, the dome on the left here, which goes back to 1790, and the telescope inside there, which I'll show you shortly, uh, is now the oldest telescope in the world in its original setting inside a dome. It's quite a remarkable telescope. It goes back to the uh, early uh, 1790s. Uh, and the other dome over there is slightly later, but it still goes back to 1827. But in fact, there's a whole series of telescopes uh, in our Mar today, which are essentially in the original places, as well as the instruments that go with them. So for instance, clocks or what, what is formerly known as regulators, these were a key part of any astronomical observation, essentially timing the passage of the stars as they passed across your telescope was one of the ways of, of essentially of obtaining the coordinates for them. And so we have a whole series of these regulators. These were the most accurate timepieces uh, of their day and they're an essential part of the observatory and they're still here today. And as are the telescopes that go with them. Uh, and I'm not going to go through uh, the individual telescopes, but we have six generations of telescopes. I say generations where you can see the essentially the technology itself actually moving on as time goes by. In fact, the very oldest telescopes we have actually go back to the time of King George, actually predate uh, observatories King George III, who, of course, was, uh, was Herschel's own patron. And in fact, there's a connection here, which I'm going to come to shortly. But essentially, we today have all the telescopes or virtual telescopes that King George uh, he had himself in his uh, observatory uh, in Kew, uh, in his palace uh, in London. So let me just say a little bit about this, this one telescope before we get down to the Herschel connection. So the, the, the main telescope that was built around the observatory, very much inspired by, by, by the connections here, is this one here called the Troutman Equatorial. And it's really going back to the start of the concept of an equatorial telescope. An equatorial means a telescope which is aligned, uh, so it's parallel to the Earth's equator, so that you only have to turn it in one direction in, to, in principle, uh, follow the stars around. This is before we had electric motors. It had to be moved manually but it was a revolution uh, in, in telescope design. And the Troughton now today is the oldest telescope, uh, which is in its original setting in a dome anywhere uh, in the world. And it still actually works. We don't use it for astronomy as a heritage piece, but it still has the optics. The dome still rotates. It still is essentially in the same condition as before. So there's been a long connection uh, to Herschel uh, and, and, and the works, and I'm going to talk about that. But I just want to make a couple of comments, first of all, about the, the academic connections. And in fact, uh, the Royal Society and the Royal Astronomical Society actually put together, but a little over 100 years ago now, the collected scientific papers uh, of uh, Sir William Herschel. And it was edited by an astronomer called John Lewis Emil Dreyer. Now, he actually was the director of our Ma at the time. He, and he, he's going to come into this story as I come later on but about his contributions to the astronomy. But in the latter part of his career, he became a leading historian of astronomy, and he's written a number of important treaties, treaties about some of the major figures uh, in astronomy, particularly um, uh, Tycho Brahe, because uh, he actually originally was Danish. And, and Dreyer actually worked in all the observatories in Ireland, and the contributions he did put to astronomy actually come from working uh, from his time in Dunsink and in Burr, as well as those uh, in, in, um, in um, Armagh. But he was the, this book, this, uh, this uh, compilation came out in 1912 uh, while he was the director. And indeed, we have a number of artifacts and papers uh, 
held uh, in the observatory. Uh, in fact, we have just put together, I say we, I've got a colleague, uh, Matthew McMahon, who's the, our collections officer, and he's actually also a PhD student, just started um, a project to do with actually understanding the history of our planetarium in Amar. And in fact, this work, which I'm going to talk about here, he has done 99% of the work. I've only done a small part of it. But we've written a small um, a paper. This is going to appear um, actually in your society journal, I think, in the next time it comes out. I'm not sure what the exact date that is. But it's going to give you an introduction to some of the material we have uh, in our MAR relating to the Herschel family uh, and indeed some areas which perhaps you might be unaware of to, to Herschel's, some of Herschel's descendants. So let me just give you a quick outline of what these connections are before we get down and start talking about some of the, um, the, the astronomy. So there's three, uh, three different levels or different eras, I could perhaps say, of connections to it. The first one goes very much back to the foundation, being inspired by the, the archbishop being inspired, and this is Archbishop Robinson being inspired to build the observatory. But then there were direct connections between uh, the archbishop and William and, and indeed Caroline, his sister, Caroline Herschel, too, um, Partly sometimes involving the astronomer royal at the time, Neville Maskell. In fact, Neville Maskell's advice was taken on in order to decide what kind of instruments to build at Amar. And the very first director of Amar Observatory, James Hamilton, actually used to go to Bath quite a, a few times uh, in order to uh, correspond and, and to talk to the Herschels and indeed obtain one of our telescopes from there. So the first connections go right back to, to our foundation. There's also a significant correspondence uh, between John Herschel, so uh, William's uh, son. Uh, of course, uh, he was a, a renowned astronomer in his own right. Uh, and his correspondence was with Romney Robinson. Now, Romney Robinson was the third director of Armagh. He actually was director for a period of 59 years, an amazing 59 years. And he was actually was a person, person who actually established the scientific reputation of Armagh Observatory. And there's a long correspondence between the two. Uh, and this actually led on to the, some of the work of the next director. This is John Dreyer, who I've already mentioned. And John Dreyer was the person who put together what's called the New General Catalogue, uh, which was essentially an extension of the work of John Herschel. And we'll come to that uh, shortly. And then finally, and actually the largest part of the papers we have here, actually relates to the family archives uh, of a person called Joseph Hardcastle, who was the fifth director at Armagh, but he also was the direct grandson of John Herschel and the great grandson uh, of William Herschel. So they're the connections, and I'm going to expand on some of those now. So the first one comes to some of the instruments. We have a, an amazing collection of, of, of instruments uh, associated with the telescopes in Amar, essentially because um, the astronomers never left here. Much of the material they used is still around the observatory. A lot of it is put in, in, a, in a storeroom, essentially in our, in our basement. It's quite hard to access, but nevertheless, the, the instruments are there. And in particular, we actually have some Herschel instruments, in particular this one here. This one actually comes from um, King, George, King George III's own collection. There's a long saga here, but the short tale of it is that Queen Victoria uh, in the middle middle of the 19th century, essentially uh, bequeathed uh, all the um, or most of the instruments from King George's uh, observatory in Kew uh, to our mass. So we actually have the telescopes uh, and the clocks, the regulators he used when he was uh, measuring the transit of Venus, the famous transit of Venus in 1769. And we have some of the other associated instruments. And in particular, there's a, a, a nine inch uh, Herschel uh, specular mirror uh, in its carrying case and with its eyepiece. You can, if you can see my, uh, my cursor, that's, uh, that's in the collection itself. And there's also some very interesting documentation. In fact, this documentation, you, I know you can't read it, but that is a, a handwritten uh, note. And it's by Caroline Herschel. It's actually written by her and actually gives you instructions for how you assemble uh, this mirror into a telescope. They call it the 10-foot telescope because, of course, in those days, they used to talk about telescopes in terms of the focal length as opposed to the actual diameter of the mirror. Uh, but the instructions are written there by Caroline Herschel about how you put that together, how you care for the specular mirrors. Uh, and these are part of our archives uh, in, in, in Armagh um, um, today. Uh, 
We also, though, actually have or did have um, one of our very first telescopes was, was actually one of Herschel's uh, telescopes of the same time. In fact, it's possibly the first or certainly one of the very earliest ones that Herschel actually sold. And in fact, the story behind this is that James Hamilton, the first director of Amar, he actually used to go to Bath quite regularly and he stayed in the, in the Archbishop's house there uh, and was in, 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 in regular contact. And between him and the, and the Archbishop, they persuaded uh, William Herschel to build them or make them, the, make them a telescope. And in fact, they placed an order at the end of 1793 it took, I think, uh, Herschel longer than he expected to, to actually make it. But two years later, it was delivered. I believe James Hamilton went back to Bath and, and collected the telescope and took it back to Armagh for the princely sum of 200 guineas. And this actually was one of the very first telescopes we actually used. The, 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 the trout in which I showed you actually took, a, took some, um, it, 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 well, that was the main telescope. It actually took a bit of time to get going. Uh, it took quite some time to, 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 to assemble. And so some of the very earliest observations done in Armagh date back to one, using one of Herschel's telescopes. And in fact, here we can see some pages from the logbook. I know you won't be able to read the details, but you can probably see some of the sketches. And these are sketches showing the moon and the planets and some descriptions about what could be seen uh, by, by Hamilton uh, when he's observing. So basically, the very earliest records we have of astronomy being done in Amar actually do use a, a Herschel uh, telescope. But perhaps the most extensive part of our collection is one, an area where you might not be that, that aware of uh, in, in the Herschel family. It's actually to do with the, the fifth director of our Ma Observatory. His name was Joseph Hardcastle, and he was indeed the grandson of John Herschel, and in fact, the great grandson of William Herschel. Unfortunately, it's a bit of a tragic tale. He was appointed in 1917 to, to the post, actually succeeding um, Dreyer, who I've already mentioned, the fourth director, succeeding uh, Dreyer, uh, and, 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 he, and he lived in England, uh, and he arranged with his family to come out. Unfortunately, on the way, he actually fell ill, uh, and he actually stayed behind in Oxford, and the rest of his family moved out to Armagh. I mean, they thought at the time it was probably going to be a short illness, and they wanted to settle in and go to the observatory and, and, and make it a place, a home. So his wife, Teresa, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the family actually moved on to Armagh. Unfortunately, uh, the, the illness proved to be terminal, and in fact, um, Joseph Hardcastle died shortly afterwards. So while he was appointed director, he never formally uh, took up his post. Uh, and, um, but his family lived in the observatory for a year. Teresa Hardcastle actually um, looked after the, the observatory. Uh, she actually helped in, maintain, for instance, we have a weather record in Amar, which we've been, we've been measuring the weather every day since, um, since actually 1795, would you believe? And she partook in that. And so uh, we, we, we regard the Hardcastles as, a, as, a, as, an, as an essential part of the history. Uh, it's a tragic part of the story, but nevertheless, Joseph Hardcastle, the grandson of John Herschel, was in fact the fifth director uh, of the observatory. And in fact, we had a recreation of that event in 2018, 100 years, because it was 1918 when Teresa Hardcastle lived in, in, in the observatory, we had a recreation with one of her descendants, in fact, her own granddaughter, Deb Percival, and there's a picture on the right there. Now, she lives in Sligo, and that actually comes to the uh, the start of my talk when that was the connection we had to find the Sligo Baroque Orchestra uh, uh, who wanted to do the music. So it all comes full circle uh, through these uh, family connections. And there's quite extensive papers and archives. And anyone who wants to look into this, um, when you see this uh, document uh, come out in your, in your society journal, uh, you will see what, what material you have uh, on that. So I'm now going to go on and reflect on some of the astronomical achievements of Herschel, but it, how they then inspired or influenced uh, some of the things that have taken place in Omar, that's not Omar, in, in Ireland, some of them in Omar, but in, in Ireland. And in fact, there's a very rich history. And indeed, uh, as alluded to at the start, it also impinges upon the, my own research and, and what I have done in my own career, because in some sense, uh, the, the kinds of things I've been investigating uh, simply following up uh, areas which Herschel, William Herschel himself, started uh, when he made those first observations uh, or all those, those, those over two centuries ago. So, of course, you're well familiar with the 40-foot telescope. We would actually call it the four-foot telescope today because of the size of the mirror, but it was 40-foot was the focal length. 
And this was an, a, an absolute revolution uh, and the size, the aperture allowing you to see things that couldn't be seen before. And indeed it inspired the next telescope to succeed that and that was one that took place in Ireland. So that's what I want to talk about now. Uh, this comes from Burr, which uh, is in, in Central Ireland and it was the Earl of Ross and he has his own castle. This famous painting over here actually illustrates what he achieved. And essentially he built telescopes in a similar principle to that uh, of, of William Herschel. They were effectively telescopes which looked along the meridian. They had a little bit of uh, slack so you could move a little bit uh, essentially either side, but they were pretty much looking uh, along the, the meridian because that made them easier to build, uh, but it also allowed you to be able to build giant telescopes. And so the Earl of Ross actually built two like, giant telescopes. The first one, you, in this, this, this famous painting, you actually can see in the background, this was his three-foot telescope. And then he liked that one so much that he was inspired to double its size and the famous six-foot Leviathan, as it became known. The Leviathan was a kind of nickname, but it sort of stuck. I don't think the Earl of Ross actually particularly liked it himself, but the name stuck, and that's what it's been known for the world. And here you can see uh, the, the mirror. In fact, he was a great engineer. He basically cast the mirror in a foundry in his own castle. In fact, the, the, um, the foundry the, uh, is actually still there. It's on the back of the castle, uh, and it's still there today. Uh, and in principle could be fired up again. Interestingly enough, while the, of course, the six foot ex ex exceeded in size the four foot diameter of, of Herschel's telescope, and so therefore this became the largest telescope in the world. In fact, by essentially by default, the three foot did become the largest telescope. When, this, when the 40 foot uh, was dismantled, which it was, I think, by John Herschel, uh, I, I haven't got the exact year, but it was in the early 1800s, he had dismantled it. Uh, because it basically became a safety concern. The three foot, which was then in existence, actually then became by default the world's largest telescope. So in some sense, the Earl of Ross actually twice built the world's largest telescope, and they can both seen uh, in this picture today. So here's a connection. This is the, the Earl of Ross, uh, uh, William Parsons, and I regard him as the great engineer. He actually has a son, the fourth Earl of Ross, who I'm going to come into as well. And he was actually the real astronomer of the family. There's a really remarkable family. They, they're multi-talented in engineering, uh, in, in astronomy, in, 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 in a number of other fields, in photography, pioneers in photography. And the place in Burr Castle is still the home uh, of the Parsons family. As they are the current residents, uh, the seventh Earl, William Brendan Parsons, and his wife, Alison, known as the Countess of Ross. And if you're ever actually in Ireland, there's a very impressive science centre which goes with it, which will tell you the whole story uh, of, uh, of the, um, well, actually, the all the things done by the, by the Parsons family. Um, there's actually connections to modern telescopes as well, which I'm not going to bring in here, the Grab Parsons firm. That's another whole area itself. But what I want to bring into here is the science that was done with this new telescope and actually how it links to the work that was done um, by John Herschel before. And it was essentially this, this immense light gathering power which allowed you to see detail which couldn't be seen before. It was not easy to do. Uh, this was an awkward telescope to use. In fact, this famous picture you can see in the bottom is, is supposed to represent the Earl of Ross heading out for nights observing, presumably after having some dinner party. And there he is in his top hat, and he's actually climbing up the ladder. And in fact, you're suspended. In fact, you can sort of see it on the, in the top picture. You're suspended well above the ground, about 50 or 60 feet up in a kind of rickety a platform. And you're looking through the eyepiece, uh, and things are shaking around, and you're trying to draw in the dark. It must have been very hard. Um, to do that, probably shouting out commands to your servants for moving a telescope back and forth. But what in particular uh, he did, uh, or in fact, it wasn't just himself, there was a team of people with it, but the Earl of Ross led this, was they started sketching some of the nebulae which had been seen by earlier generations of astronomers. And the most famous one is this one you can see on the right, and you can see this spiral form over here. So let me talk a little bit more about that because it comes in this next picture. And in fact, you can see the direct direct um, development uh, from the time uh, of, of John Herschel uh, and what he saw for the same object. So this particular one here, we now call this the Whirlpool Galaxy. 
well, this is actually what it is. But the concept of galaxy was not appreciated back in the 1800s. In fact, we thought everything around us was the galaxy. There was only one galaxy. It was the one we live in. Well, this is the start of understanding that there's a much larger universe around us, a very important part of the development of astronomy. Uh, this is also a nebula, which, I mean, uh, Herschel or even Earl of Ross didn't discover it. In fact, it goes back to, uh, well, I don't know if you discovered it, but it was certainly in the Messier catalog. It's, it's actually known as Messier 51. It's a, a nebulous object um, uh, seen by uh, the French astronomer Charles Messier. But here was the drawing that John Herschel made of it. And it's certainly a rather bit of an enigma. You can sort of see two kind of circles and two kind of blobs in the middle. But it's, it's, it's really hard to get any feel for what that is. And it's a kind of perplexing object. It's when this was seen through the Leviathan and the extra light gathering power, suddenly those rings were resolved into this, this, this spiral structure. Uh, this, this wonderful spiral structure. It's certainly an enigma. What on earth was this spiral structure there? And remarkably, that image that the, the, the Earl of Ross drew turns out to be remarkably close to what uh, a modern view is. And that's actually one of the pic a picture I show on the right. A, a, a telescope take with a ca camera, a modern electronic camera, actually takes a picture which is very, very close to it. So it shows you how good... His, his drawing and his interpretation of the image is because it is very much a subjective thing to be looking through an eyepiece and trying to sketch and note what you do. And what we know today is these, this spiral structure. We know those are what are called spiral arms and they're the regions where young stars are forming uh, and they're very luminous because some of the young stars are very brilliant. Uh, and they're essentially they're part of this sort of the engine which drives a galaxy. And what we're seeing here is what's known as a spiral galaxy. But that was not known back when this was drawn. In fact, there's a debate. Uh, this was also involved very closely with Romney Robinson, the third director of Armagh. In fact, he was regularly coming down to Burr at the time. And there's correspondence between um, uh, Robinson and the Earl of Ross. And, and Robinson was speculating, are these what are called misty chevulers, basically misty, misty bits of gas, or are they vast congeries of stars? These are the words they use. Robinson was actually convinced he would, they were congruous of stars. In other words, he thought he was resolving stars inside them. Well, in some sense, Robinson actually was right. They are full of stars, but there was no way he could have known that at the time because we now know that these are distant galaxies. And it wasn't until the early part of the 20th century, the work of people like Edward Hubble, when we managed to estimate the distances and discover that these were millions of light years away, that we started to realize what they were. But it all started, uh, essentially this is now the realm of the galaxies and now modern astronomy is very much focused, a lot of it, on understanding the most distant galaxies going back to the, to the Big Bang itself. And we'll come back to that at the very end of today when we talk about um, the infrared. But it all started uh, here in the Earl of Ross and that was a follow on from John Herschel. I also want to, uh, another re um, relation here is, is, is this catalogue, which is the work of Dreyer, which also directly follows on from the work uh, of John Herschel. So Herschel, I mean, the, the, the telescopes that the Herschels used, they, they made these star catalogues by these, these sweeping out the sky. They, they, would, they, they, would move, they would scan the telescope and down. They would note the objects. I mean, this, 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 the stories, of, I'm sure you've heard them about, shouting out what they were seeing and Caroline Herschel writing down and recording as they go. And they did produce catalogues. Uh, John Herschel uh, ended up producing what was called the General Catalog of Nebulae, a very extensive catalog of, of, of these fuzzy objects in the sky. But unfortunately, it suffered from the fact that the way the, the Herschel telescopes worked, you couldn't get very accurate coordinates. So they, they could be many arc minutes wrong. The objects were there, but actually having listed in the right place uh, it, 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 they weren't right, basically. And this is where, um, where Dreyer came in. Uh, this was a, Dreyer was using, in fact, he had a telescope built in our mouth called the Grub 10 inch. I'll show a picture on the left. That telescope is still in our mouth today and it still works. And in fact, we still occasionally use it for public viewing. Uh, and he was able with this telescope to essentially look at these objects, get accurate coordinates for them. He wasn't just using the telescopes in Amar, by the way. He used telescopes at Bern and, uh, and, and Dunsink and, and, and compiled from around the world. But he produced this, this, this catalogue called the New General Catalogue 
of nebulae and clusters of stars. And you can see from the front cover, it's basically built upon work on here, built upon the work of Sir John Herschel uh, himself. And this catalogue has stood the test of time because uh, all professional astronomers today, they generally have their favourite NGC object, which they probably studied while they were a student. Uh, because in fact, it turns out that most of the objects in the NGC actually are galaxies. And so this became a comprehensive catalogue of galaxies when the, 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 uh, when the concept of galaxies then had entered into the, uh, the lexicon uh, in, the, in the 20th century itself. So this is a fundamental catalogue and you can see the original one in our mouth today. That's actually the catalogue there with actually uh, Dreyer's uh, handwriting. He's got some annotations where he's got various corrections uh, to the catalogue. So that's the first part of what I'll talk about. I'm going to move on to some other topics there, but I just want to just say a couple of other words before I move on. The three observatories in, in Ireland, um, Dunsink, uh, Armagh and, and Burr, we are actually, we, we have the fantastic astronomical heritage and we've, we have come together and we're just starting to look at the process of actually seeking world heritage uh, listing for us. It's a long process, this, we've only just started. If it, if, it, if it is successful, it'll probably be another decade away. And it's another, it's a whole tale beyond what I'm going to, I want to talk about tonight. But I just want to let you know that we are now aspiring for seeking our World Heritage uh, listing uh, based upon, uh, based upon the, the contributions to astronomy through the, through the, um, through the, uh, um, not, well, the 18th and 19th centuries. Anyway, the next one I want to turn on to now is another area where Herschel's contribution was profound uh, and is still driving modern astronomy today. And this was his first attempt to actually make a, a map of, of what we now call the galaxy. And simply the way, I mean, when you look out on the, on the sky in a dark night, and unfortunately, very few of us get to see this anymore because we live in cities and we don't see the skies uh, as, as they should be. But there is this band of stars that run across the sky, what we call the Milky Way. Herschel tried to quantify what he was seeing. And essentially, he, he looked at the uh, and he essentially counted the stars uh, in, in various directions. And he also looked at how bright they were. And he made what is most, the most logical assumption is that if all stars are the same brightness, then essentially how far away they are would be based upon um, how bright they appeared to, to, to you. And by counting that, you essentially could try and draw a map uh, of the galaxy. And this was Herschel's first one, was first, the first attempt really to put our place uh, in the cosmos, going beyond the solar system, where's the place of our star in the galaxy itself. And some elements of this, this famous sketch, some of them are right. I mean, the, 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 the most key one is that we are living <clears throat> in a band of stars, uh, and that is the Milky Way. But Herschel um, placed our sun in the wrong place. He placed us very close to the center. It wasn't because Herschel was careless or anything like that. It's because there turned out to be aspects of our galaxy which he could not have been aware of then. And the most critical one for this is what we now know as the interstellar dust. And so I now want to talk about how that is, is, has a, is, has, has a understanding our galaxy is still a key part of song today and it's actually going to touch upon some of the work I own my own do so I'm just going to say a little bit about that so here is a modern view essentially of that and we can take these beautiful pictures these days with with all sky cameras this is a picture actually of my own favorite telescope uh it's in the southern hemisphere in Australia it's called the Montfort telescope that's what there it's a radio telescope but what it's really showing you is a beautiful view of the Milky Way uh and we now see what, um, in the Southern Hemisphere, you see the Milky Way more clearly than you do uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. And while we see this band of stars, you also see all these black bands over here. And that's what uh, Herschel was not able to witness. They're hidden by dust in the star. There's dust actually blocking out the light of stars behind them. And in fact, we're not seeing fully, and we're only seeing a small part of the way of our galaxy. So now we can see beyond that, in fact, in particular with infrared, which I'll be coming to, we can see right across our galaxy and see all the stars. But nevertheless, um, uh, it was a start. However, I'm going to digress here because it, it, this is an area where I'm actually spending a lot of my own time. And I just want to show you an illustration of how astronomers are now trying to probe and map uh, the size of our galaxy. So just a, a apologize, there's a couple of slightly more technical slides. But essentially, 
those dark bands are full of gas and they're full of molecules. And those molecules are actually bright in radio wavelengths, technically what's called millimeter wavelengths. And if you've got a radio telescope which can pick up uh, radiation at a, a wavelength of about three millimeters, you can chart molecules in the sky. And so I've been involved in a survey to try and map those molecules. And the molecules are moving and they have, therefore have a, what's called a Doppler shift. And so by, by tuning to different frequencies, you can measure those, me measure those motions. So I'm gonna play a little video now uh, but the video might not come out that well on Zoom, so I just want to explain what's in it. You're basically going to see four bands running across the sky. That is what's called the longitude. It's basically the direction of the sky, and we're going to be seeing about 90 degrees, which is about a, a, a one quadrant uh, of the sky uh, in a band across there. And the black you're going to be seeing are uh, where the, the clouds of molecules are, what astronomers now call giant molecular clouds. These are the sites where stars form. The other stuff you'll see, you'll see a lot of twinkling, that is actually noise. And that's actually good in the sense that if you don't have noise in your data, you're, you're not seeing it. So I'm just going to stop the share and put a new one on uh, and play this. It's, uh, and apologize if, if the Zoom uh, doesn't work so well for you, but I'll just play it uh, and talk over it. Uh, and essentially what we're doing now is we're seeing this scan across the sky uh, in longitude, the quadrant of the sky, and the velocity is changing. And as the velocity changes, we're seeing clouds of molecules. These clouds of molecules can weigh up to 100,000 times the mass uh, of our sun. We call them giant molecular clouds. And as the velocity shifts, we're moving across the galaxy, and we can actually use those velocities to work out how far away they are um, there's a model for that, it's called the galactic rotation curve, but you can essentially try and build up a three-dimensional picture of where these are. So what we're trying to do essentially is, is, is interpret ultimately what Herschel started and build up a proper picture of our galaxy. Uh, in this case, no longer looking at the stars, but looking at the gas and the dust and using the motions of the molecules to try and do that. And so we've been involved in a survey of that. I'm just going to stop the stop the, the, here now. Um, but uh, that's an, we, we, this is essentially we're continuing to pursue the same kind of objectives uh, as Herschel did uh, all those years ago. So that is um, that is uh, modern science. But what I want to come to now is perhaps where Herschel's contribution is most profound, and in fact, it's directly. Uh, uh, influencing uh, and driven, in fact, the the the, the currently the I, I guess it's the most expensive telescope in history. The picture on the right, I'm sure members of society are quite familiar with. It is um, the famous painting uh, of of Herschel William Herschel's discovery of this unknown radiation, what we now call the infrared radiation. Obviously, this is not quite the way he did it. It's, it's an artist's impression. It puts all the great contributions of Herschel, the, the 40 foot telescope, uh, the telescope uh, he used to find um, Uranus, I think it is, uh, in, in the background. But the concept was that he had a prism, basically a bit of glass, uh, sunlight came through it, it spreads it out into its colors, and he put thermometers in where the light was being spread out. He saw the temperature rose, but then he put a thermometer beyond uh, the red end of the spectrum, and he saw the temperature also rose there. In other words, there was some kind of radiation also falling onto the, onto the thermometer, and this was essentially the discovery of infrared radiation. Now, at the time, that was, that was interesting, but no one really had any concept of, 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 of what that was. We now know that that is really the start of the understanding of what's called the spectrum. And we now, in astronomers, go all the way from gamma rays all the way to radio waves and optical and infrared are in the middle. And we need to go through all these parts of the spectrum in order to understand astronomical sources. So that's the background. We will come to the, the James Webb Space Telescope at the very last part of this, because that is where this discovery has led today because the James Webb has basically been built to measure infrared radiation and particularly infrared radiation coming from the very first stars and galaxies, literally, and the most distant part of the universe, effectively uh, soon after the Big Bang. But I want to get there and build the story up because the next bit of the story actually is an island. And it goes back to the Earl of Ross and Burr Observatory. But in fact, it's not the third Earl, it's the fourth Earl of Ross. 
Uh, that's his son. His name was Lawrence. And he actually was more of a pure astronomer than his father. His father was really the great engineer, whereas the, the fourth Earl was more of the astronomer. In fact, actually started publishing various catalogues of nebulae and, uh, and so on. In fact, he actually published the first catalogue of the spiral nebulae. But he also did this experiment to try and um, further the experiment of Herschel. Now, Herschel was basically looking at sunlight. So in some sense, OK, the sun is a star, but it was daytime. He wasn't directly trying to look at uh, astronomical sources, certainly not, not, not outside the sun. Lawrence Parson actually tried the same experiment, but he did it by trying to look at the moon. And in fact, he was using his three foot telescope. So I'll just go over here, that picture. And so he was actually using the three foot. The three foot was more uh, easy to, 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 to use. But he used the three-foot telescope and basically focused the, the, the light down. And essentially, he had his own equivalent of a thermometer. And he was able to, therefore, to measure essentially the heat of the moon, as they called it, measuring the heat of the moon. They came out and found, well, he, he, he um, at, the, at the time, uh, it was thought, in fact, the moon would be below freezing. Uh, uh, and his measurements actually suggested it was about 247 Fahrenheit. Now, that actually is not not the correct value, but nevertheless, it's, it's not too far off. When the astronauts and Neil Armstrong actually landed there and they made direct measurements in 1969, it turned out to be 150 degrees. Um, nevertheless, uh, the first uh, indication that the moon was not as cold as otherwise came from the Earth of Ross. And basically, it was following on from the work of, of Herschel. If you go to Burr today, Actually, in this, this, this picture I've got on the right there is from the display case uh, in the science gallery, uh, and it explains the experiment. But there's also there a letter from Neil Armstrong. And Neil Armstrong is basically acknowledging the work of the Earl of Ross uh, in, in pioneering or carrying on the pioneering of infrared astronomy uh, and basically starting to understand what the moon would be like for when he, he then visited in 1969 in that, uh, in that epic moonwalk. But, so moving on there. But infrared is a central part of astronomy, and indeed, it's how I started my own astronomy. So um, as, as introduction said, I actually did my uh, PhD using this telescope. It's the UKIRT telescope. UK, at this, that stage, actually ran this telescope. It now actually is run by other uh, elsewhere, but it's still called the UKIRT. It's on Hawaii. It's on a volcano 4,000 meters high. And the picture you can see here is it's above the clouds. And it's built there because it's a very stable place. And you get very clear skies, and it's able to, it's got low water vapor, and that's very good for seeing the infrared radiation. The picture I show there is actually the one that I took for my thesis. Uh, when I want to say it's a picture, it was built up painstakingly point by point. It's a map of, of a supernova remnant in molecules, in fact, in the hydrogen molecule, and it covers a region nearly a degree in size. Um, Infrared was still quite a primitive science uh, when I was doing my PhD, which is nearly 40 years ago today. But it was going through a revolution then, as it's going through a revolution now. The revolution then was to introduce what are called arrays, uh, basically um, be able to take images as, a, as, a, as opposed to a point by point, what you all are familiar with with your mobile phones. You just click and take a picture. You can now do that with the infrared. And so infrared has been going on and developing but because of the, um, the Earth's atmosphere, we're still limited to what we can do on the Earth. And so, in fact, infrared has moved into space and a lot of the infrared. So here's some of the pictures of some of the infrared spacecraft that have been built since then. One of them on the bottom right was actually just been launched while I was taking my PhD. And a number of nations have done that. And indeed, one of them, because acknowledging Herschel, the, the, the most recent bar, James Weber talked about, was indeed named after Herschel himself, the Herschel Space Observatory. And it was a joint uh, ESA NASA mission. Gosh, it's 2009 now. It's 14 years ago. I still think it's a fairly recent one, but it's 14 years ago. And it really did revolutionize the subject. And, and, and it was a very large mirror until James Webb went up. Three and a half meters in space was a very impressive mirror, basically the same size uh, as the UKIRT telescope I was using for my own uh, PhD, but there in space. And in space, you can cool it right down to temperatures close to absolute zero, and you could be far, far more sensitive. And you can see right across the, the, the infrared spectrum in ways you can't from the ground. But of course, now it's the James Webb up there at six and a half meters. And so I'm just going to finish my talk by showing a couple of pictures from James Webb to help reflect on where we've come from Herschel's time to the wonderful 
clarity of the images we're now seeing. And these are infrared images. They're so good, it's sometimes be hard to think that they're infrared. We might just think they're typical optical pictures. Of course, they've been uh, transformed into the optical wave bands so that we can see them. So the infrared wave bands come in and then you have to put the different filter bands into optical colors so that we can perceive them. But we have this amazing detail uh, uh, and it's coming from regions which are cold, um, which are embedded in dust. Infrared allows you to see through them and also lets you see things which are a long way away. But this first one is of, uh, of a star forming region. And just to give you an illustration of what we're doing, I show the same kind of area. This is an optical picture of what's called the cleaner star forming complex. It's a very bright one in the Southern Hemisphere. You can actually see this with your naked eye as a, as a, as a fuzzy patch in the sky. And there's a bright star called Eta Carina here. But in fact, the Herschel, sorry, the James Webb picture is that tiny, tiny bit up there. If I go back over there, oops, over there, you can see the incredible detail in that tiny, tiny patch, uh, which the web is now allowing us to, to, uh, to, to, to see. So one aspect is that we're now peering through the galaxy in ways that Herschel couldn't imagine, uh, seeing through the clouds of gas and dust, which blocked his view and his first interpretation. The other part of it, and perhaps the, one of the driving reasons for building the, 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 the JWST, is that um, when you start looking out into the distant universe, the light itself is shifted. It's what astronomers call redshifted. They're moving from optical wavelengths into infrared wavelengths. So if you were to look with Hubble Space Telescope, for instance, there's a limit to how far you can see because the optical radiation has been shifted out of the wave band if you start going too far away. And yet the formation of the very first galaxies in the universe which took place over 10 billion years ago in time and requires us to look at vast redshifts away where the radiation has been moved in the infrared. So here's one of the early pictures. In this case, it's a galaxy cluster. Um, all the objects you're seeing there are some kind of cities of stars, apart from one or two of the bright star in the middle. Some of them are distorted. That distortion is due to the effect of what's called gravitational lensing, which is another whole exotic concept, but it's basically the bending of light due to gravity. And we're now starting to see back to the formation uh, of the first galaxy. So this is where, um, this is essentially the journey started by Herschel uh, when he started to probe our own galaxy, his first uh, map of our galaxy, taken further by the Earl of Ross in Burr when they the pictures of the spiral nebulae and the realization later on that there was a universe of galaxies. And now we have the James Webb able to peer back close to the Big Bang itself and see galaxies upon galaxies and where they're starting to form. And that's where astronomy has come today. So at that point, I, I will finish my talk and I'll just leave you with a lovely picture of our beautiful observatory in Armagh on a nice dark night. We still do get nice dark nights and you can see some of the historic domes uh, and the connections in those domes uh, do go back to the astronomy uh, from the days of the Herschels. So thank you very much. I'll stop the share. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, we'll uh, see for a start if there's any uh, questions in the room. Right, in the front there. I'm not, yeah. um, hang on a minute, I'll give you the... Uh, I know very little about astronomy. What is the purpose of the domes? Do they rotate? So I, I, I didn't catch all the. Can you say that again, please? Uh, okay. Do, I don't know much about astronomy. Do the domes? Do they oh, rotate? Yes, okay, yes, indeed they do rotate. In fact, that's another key part of it. These domes, the one that you can see behind me over here, back both of them rotate. There are no motors on them. What actually kind of, they've got a kind of winch and you kind of push it, uh, and but they do rotate and they've got a little shutter in the middle and you move the shutter up and so the telescope can look out the shutter. And indeed, the dome we have in our mar and the one in, in Dun Sink uh, the oldest examples in the world uh, of domes with rotate uh, are built on piers which go into the earth, which separate them from from the building. It really is a, a very important part of the development of modern astronomy. Is the domes we have 
have there. Today, of course, domes are motorized and and uh, and you just push a button and everything works for you. But yes, uh, that that's what they are. They rotate. So, um, my question is, uh, you that picture you showed us of the Karina star being formed, um, mm -hmm. the colors, uh, are they as seen by the telescope or are they... Um, well, when you're looking at something in infrared, of course, the colors, we couldn't actually see them with our eye. So we have to translate them into something that we can perceive. So what we have, we're, we're looking in the infrared at wavelengths which are beyond our vision. Um, uh, and so, but you, you, but you essentially get an electronic uh, image. And what you then do is you say, say you've got three wavelengths. I'll just say them for the sake of argument. One's at two microns, one's at three microns, one's at four microns. Those are wavelengths in infrared. You might say two microns, we'll put that as the blue color. Three microns in the green color, four microns in the red color. And then our eyes can then start to appreciate or interpret them. But of course, that's actually not the true color. We do have to turn it into something which our eyes can process. But once you do that, then you can start interpreting them once you understand why the colors are what they are. Thank you, so the color codes, basically. It's color coding, yes, essentially that's what it is. It's color coding um, uh, to help us, help us visualize what, what is taking place. Thank you. The uh, climate in Ireland is not quite the same as the climate in Hawaii. Um, Indeed. To what extent with the three observatories, you, historical observatories you mentioned in Ireland, was the weather an issue? Well, I mean, the weather, of course, is an issue, and the weather in Ireland is pretty much uh, the same as <laughs> the weather. Actually, the Duke of all getting in Bath, it's probably a little bit wetter, but not too much wetter. For, when they were doing the observing in the, in the 18th, 19th century, I mean, this, it, 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 I mean, it was, it, while it was an issue, that the demands on the telescopes weren't like what they are today. So if you simply had a telescope and you had some clear weather, you could do astronomy through it. And in fact, about um, half the time, you actually have skies which are clear, at least not raining, they mightn't be perfect. So you can still do perfectly good astronomy for the demands of the day. But of course, the needs of astronomy have now moved on. We need to see far more fainter, sensitive things, uh, and you need to go to much better sites. So the observatories, in fact, uh, on these islands today, people basically don't do optical astronomy. At least they don't do it for, 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 for trying to take frontline research. Some kind of astronomy we can do on our island, particularly radio astronomy. Uh, and radio astronomy, certainly the longer wavelength in radio astronomy, we still can actually, the Earth is still transparent. Uh, to that rain doesn't affect it. So it depends what kind of astronomy you're doing. But indeed, yes, modern infrared and optical astronomy has moved to places like Hawaii or Chile or the Canary Islands, basically tops of mountains which are dry and high and above much of the Earth's atmosphere. Right. <clears throat> we'll take a couple of questions from the chat channel, and then we'll go back to the room. Don't worry, we'll come back to you. Okay. So. Roger Moses, who's uh, also been one of our speakers a few times, um, he says, he just makes a comment. He says, you're on his visit list. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, Richard Bottle asks, what are the main themes of current research at the Amar observatories? Okay, it's a dangerous question to ask an astronomer. They might get start talking about all their favorite bits of research. But look, in terms of the way we actually operate as a, as a research institution, we're like a small university department. I have half a dozen uh, astronomers who are like academics in the department, and they all have their own research topics. And we study the stars. We have people looking at the endpoints of, of, of stars um, uh, and the evolution of massive stars. Uh, myself, I'm looking at our galaxy molecular clouds, and we have people looking at the hearts of other galaxies and how they form and evolve. And indeed, we have people looking at our own solar system and, uh, and the sun uh, and some of the dynamics of planetary motion. So basically, we have a wide range of things that we look at, very similar to a many a university department all over the UK. Right. And um, Owen uh, Brazel asks, uh, did Dunsink have anything to do with the Herschels? 
the connections are, I think, um, not so clear. The uh, um, the People like um, Dreyer worked at, Dun at Dunsink. So he, so the, in that sense, the astronomy that was done in those places was following on from there. But, but they don't, to my knowledge, have the collections of archives and, and, and things which we have in our ma. But you can't separate Dunsink in some ways from our ma and, and Burr because the three observatories, the people there work together. So they all influence each other. But the, the most direct connections do come to, indeed from Amar and actually from, from Burr. And um, Maggie Collins asks, is there access to Amar Observatory for the public? All the yes. historical documents. <laughs> <laughs> there is. We do indeed have, have tours. You can book tours. We are, I mean, the major thing we have is a planetarium. We have 60, in fact, we had 60,000 visitors last year, which is the hard, largest we've ever had coming through our grounds. Some of them are indeed going through tours. I mean, the tours are small group numbers. We can't take large numbers uh, because the building doesn't, doesn't permit it, but it, it's certainly, a, I guess, quite a premium experience. But the planetarium and our astro park, I haven't talked about that, but we're actually surrounded in quite extensive grounds with a number of astronomically themed exhibits. So our, web, our website will tell you all about it, armar.space, if you want to learn more, armar.space. Right, we're now returning to the room. My name is Martin Sturge. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. My question is this, if I can give you light. How sharp, in, dare I say, optical terms can the, or in photographic terms, can the perception be of what I would call a radio signal. How sharp? Well, it, there's not a single answer to that question, but you can the what's called the angular resolution uh, of a telescope. Um, it basically depends upon its wavelength and its size. And in fact, in the radio, you can actually get the sharpest images of all because you can make radio telescopes the size of the Earth. Because uh, the signal coming to two distant radio telescopes can be correlated together, which basically means phased up. And in principle, that creates a telescope diameter of the Earth. And that, of course, will have incredible resolution, only for a tiny, tiny patch of sky. Uh, and, and have all the resolutions in between. So what's called the, the I mean, what's called the, the angular resolution of the telescope, um, you can get very sharp images across all wave bands, uh, depending upon quite what you're doing. At the same time, you can also take low resolution images. And sometimes low resolution images are fine if you're trying to look at a very wide field uh, where you simply can't deal with the detail on the finest scale. So there's no single answer to that question, but um, it, it's, it's also a key part of all of modern astronomy is whatever task you're doing, you need to know what kind of resolution you have for the particular science that you're, you're trying to, uh, to further. Thank you very much. Hello. Um, were, was your observatory able to see the green comet that flew across uh, a couple of days ago? Um, well, uh, let's say we probably could if we were looking for it. <laughs> we, we weren't yeah. looking for it, so um, yeah. none of us reported. I'm not, the weather hasn't been the greatest these last few days either. But um, there'll be no reason why we couldn't have seen it if someone was actually trying to, to do so, yes. <laughs> but I mean, the, that modern, we, I perhaps should say, our observatory in Amar, the kind of science that we're doing, we're not using those telescopes to do the science. They're, they're historic telescopes. Occasionally we do public viewing with some, but the telescopes we're using are, are on distant mountaintops all around the world, and they're used for pre programmed. Uh, uh, projects which we've been awarded time. So we're not going out there staring up in the sky and, and hoping to see things. We, when our astronomers go out, it's because they have a well-planned project which they prepared for weeks or months in advance, as, as do most astronomers around, the, most professional astronomers around the world. Okay. Well, there's very little left of the Herschel 40 foot telescope. What happened to the outdoor telescope from there? Is there any... Uh, well, the, the, the six... 
the Leviathan is still there. Uh, the Leviathan has actually had um, uh, significant uh, restoration work done, uh, and you can visit it these days. You can't, they don't actually move it up and down, though in principle they can. Unfortunately, they've run into some issues with health and safety, uh, and so they don't tend to move it. But no, you can walk around it, you can see it from the outside, uh, and the Burr Science Gallery, oh dear, my, are you hearing them? Yeah. Um, are you hearing me? Yeah, we can still hear you. You're... Yeah, sorry, it, it, it froze, I saw. Um, and the Burr Science Gallery will tell you the whole story. So if you go to Burr, it's actually a wonderful garden. It's a very extensive garden. So it's actually a great place to visit. And you can indeed see the Leviathan. And you'll see the modern telescope there, which is called LOFAR. And that's a radio telescope. Very different to how you might envisage a telescope. But there's a modern state-of-the-art telescope called LOFAR, which measures radio waves in Burr Castle. You know, I just wanted to take over from the other question about the green comet that's been seen recently. Um, my question really refers to the color. Um, I mean, why was it green? Sorry, I'm talking about, I, I, I haven't studied green this comet. comet. I, I presume it's to do with some of the material, some of the uh, constituents in the comet itself, uh, but I can't tell you because it's not something I've, I've I've studied. I mean, when you see color in astronomy, um, if it's um, it often it's an indicator uh, of uh, it, it, depending whether it's, it, it's a spectral line measurement or a, a broadband, it can be an indicator of the type of material that's coming from. But I I haven't actually been following that comment, so I can't I can't tell you that one. Right. Well, it looks like we've um, come to the end of the questions. So uh, this is a time to thank you very much for such a, a, a fascinating talk. I mean, this has included um, brilliant science linked to some really um, amazing people. So uh, a really, a really interesting story. So uh, uh, let's all put our hands together and uh, thank uh, Professor Michael Burton. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope I might see some of you out in Ireland one day. It's uh, well worth a visit. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll terminate the session then. Okay.